I lead you in a simple prayer. Just pray this. Father God, as I open your word now, show me myself and show me my Savior. Just pray, God, as I open your word now, would you show me myself? I'm blind to myself. I trick myself. I make excuses for myself. God, as I open your word now, would you show me myself? And God, as I open your word now, would you show me my Savior? God, I'm done hoping in myself. I'm done trying to save myself. But show me my Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who lived for me, died for me, rose again for me, and is coming for me. Oh, Father, as I open your word now, show me myself and show me my Savior, Jesus. Amen. We'll bring in Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 5 down to about verse 9. And there's one key question asked here. It's asked in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, which is just a quote from Psalm chapter 8 where this question originates. And it's a a really good question. The question is, what is man? Who am I? God brings you, the Spirit of God brings you into church, particularly this church where we take God's word seriously because the Spirit of God wants to not only answer your questions but even back it up from that and show you the kinds of questions that you should be asking. This is a great question. And if you would hear the Spirit of God speak to your spirit, the answer to this question, it would help you make sense of the riddle that is you and all the other people who are around you who you can't make sense of half the time. The question is, what is man? And I'm going to give you three answers to that question from Hebrews chapter 2 and from Psalm chapter 8. To the question, what is man? There are three answers. One, man is Adam. Two, man is us. And three, man is Jesus. What is man? Man is Adam. Man is us. Man is Jesus. First, man is Adam. That is man as created. Secondly, man is us. Man as corrupted. Third, man is Jesus. That is humanity as recreated, uncorrupted, redeemed. Man is Adam, unfallen. Man is us, fallen. Man is Jesus, recovering us and rescuing us from the fall. Man is Adam, destined for glory and greatness. Man is us, dying in dust and frustration. Man is Jesus, destroying death, lifting us up from the dust, and restoring to us the glory for which we were created. In Adam, man was destined for glorious rule. In our fall, in us, we're corrupted, we're dying, and we suffer. But in Jesus, we get restored to a life that is beyond our wildest imaginations of what life could be. Man is Adam, created and destined. Man is us, corrupted and dying. Man is Jesus, redeemed and restored. The question is asked in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, what is man? The question is answered in Hebrews 2, verses 6 and 7 and 8, which are a quotation from Psalm chapter 8. And then the, the, the full application of that is given in verse 9 when it talks about Jesus. To answer the question, what is man, 
It actually requires the whole Bible story from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. You know, anybody, actually everybody, asks the question when they look in the mirror, who am I? Who do I want to be? You don't have to believe the Bible or, or be a Christian to wonder about that question. But the Bible, if you'll listen to it, actually gives a better and more glorious and more dignified answer to that question than any answer that a Bible-denying, God-denying humanity could ever come up with on its own. It's as if in our attempt to exalt ourselves, we've forgotten the Bible, but everything we say about exalting ourselves doesn't even exalt us as high as the Bible would exalt us if we would just listen to it. I love the Bible's answer to this question, what is man? Because it takes the whole Bible to answer it, the whole storyline of Scripture. So here, here in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What is man? Man is Adam, destined for life and glory. Man is us. Busted, corrupted in death and a curse. Man is Jesus, who for a little while became lower than the angels and tasted death so that death could be killed and the curse reversed. Here in uh, Hebrews 2, where it quotes from Psalm 8, we actually find three uh, orders of creation. God himself is not an order of creation. He's the creator. But here you see three orders of creation, like animal, vegetable, mineral, this kind of thing. In verse 5, the first order of creation is angels. It says, not to angels did God do this. The first order of creation is angels. The second order of creation, verse 6, is man. What is man? That you are mindful of him. So in the three orders of creation, we have angels, man, and third, we have everything else. That is the fish that pass through the seas, the oxen, the sheep, and the horse in the field, the birds in the air, everything else that's in creation. We see angels, humanity, and all the rest of creation. And Hebrews 2 and Psalm 8 and really the entire story of the Bible establishes the value of angels, the value of all of creation, and then astonishingly, it pivots and exalts the value of humanity in Jesus. You ever want to know the value of things are Amy and I the only ones that watch that kind of dumb show, Antiques Roadshow? I don't care about antiques. I don't have any antiques. I don't want any antiques. And I don't even like the program, Antiques Roadshow. But whenever I spin through the channels and it's on, I have to stop and watch it. I'm just drawn to it. Because I'm just waiting for, you know, this, this nice old lady who, who paid, you know, $2,000 for this painting and she brings it in and I'm waiting for the appraiser to tell her that that painting is worth 20 bucks at most. <laughs> we want the value of what it is we're looking at to be established. Hebrews 2, Psalm 8, you, me, when we're looking at each other or when we're looking in the mirror, what is the value of a human soul? What's it worth? What's it about? What is man? Angels, 
humans, all the rest of creation. It was Thomas Aquinas who wrote in the Antiques Roadshow 1200s, 800 years ago, Thomas Aquinas uh, explaining Hebrews 2 and Psalm 8 placed man at a humanity, that is men and women, at a midpoint between angels above us and the rest of the creatures below us. Aquinas said, and I think he was right, that humanity, that's you, are a spirit body, a spirit body. The angels are only spirit. They have no body. The animals below you are only body. They have no spirit. It's humanity that has the dignity and the glory of being both a spiritual and material being. Man has both. This is exactly what Psalm 8 describes. C.S. Lewis, uh, much more contemporary than Aquinas, took basically what Aquinas said and modernized it in his writings when he said that uh, we are amphibians, that curious creature that can live in both realms, the water and the land. C.S. Lewis said that as spirits, we belong to eternity. And as animals, material beings, we inhabit and experience our life in time. Angels are all spirit. They only exist in the spiritual realm. And animals are all material and they only exist in the material realm. But we are both. I think that, that C.S. Lewis was right. I think that Aquinas was right. I think that's what Psalm 8 is saying. In fact, what we're doing right now essentially proves that. We've gathered together to worship and we've gathered now to listen to the preaching of the word and I don't preach in this moment to angels, do I? They may be present and invisible, but I don't, I'm not talking to them. They ain't talking to me. And in this moment, I'm not speaking to animals. As much as some of you have asked me, when are we going to have bring our dogs and cats to church day? We're never going to have that day, no matter how many times you ask. It's not what preaching in church is for. It's for you, women and men. The warning in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that we just looked at for the last two Sunday mornings, the warning in Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, is not a warning to angels, and it's not a warning to animals. It's a warning to you. We see angels. We see the rest of creation. Oh, but in verse 9, we see Jesus. In verse 9, it says, but we see him, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. That is, Jesus became for a little while lower than the angels so that he could redeem us from the curse and death. The point of Hebrews chapter 2 is the present sufficiency and the permanent supremacy of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 was written by a pastor, a much better pastor than me, but a pastor like me, who was writing to people that he loved who were struggling in their faith. And the point that he keeps emphasizing to them is the present sufficiency and the permanent supremacy of Jesus Christ. And the reason he makes that point is because just like you, the people who first heard this sermon lived in a world where it didn't seem rewarding to be a Christian. Everything tilted against Christianity. In fact, there was persecution against those who followed Christ. And so the pastor's just desperate and urgent to preach this message to his people about the, the, the present sufficiency and the permanent supremacy of Jesus Christ. And just like, it's the same way I, that I feel. Because man, this world is not fair. Because everything that's good and pleasurable and shiny and fun in this world has the potential to draw you away from Jesus. Because you just want this and this. And if Jesus says no, you still want it anyway. 
And it's not fair because on the other side, everything that is dangerous and frightening in this world, like persecution, equally has the possibility of pulling you away from Jesus. It's like if, I, if holding on to Jesus is going to make me pay this price, then I'm just going to throw Jesus under the bus and go my way. And so in this tension that the original recipients were in and that you are in right now, we keep punching this message home every week and every week in various ways that Jesus is better and that he's supreme and that he's sufficient. Because if you know the answer specifically, the answer as it's revealed here in Hebrews 2, you'll understand Jesus, you'll understand yourself, you'll understand how the world works. Loop back with me to, to Psalm 8. Hebrews 2 is a faithful sermon. And any faithful sermon delivered by a faithful gospel minister will be an explanation and exposition of Scripture. So the sermon that is Hebrews 2 is an explanation and exposition and application of Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a marvelous psalm because it starts and ends with the glory of God. It, the two divine names, Jehovah our Adonai, begin and end the psalm in this poetic inclusio. And there are four movements in the psalm. They're easy to discern because the first and fourth movements are the same. The glory and majesty of God is the first and the glory and majesty of God is the fourth. It, it ends as it began. And then the two movements in the middle are also easy to discern because the first movement is how small and insignificant does man seem? And yet the second movement is how marvelously and gloriously has God exalted humanity? You see all four of these movements here in Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is a spectacular example of what the Psalms are because the Psalms are about the glory and majesty of God. But let's be honest, the glory of God is sort of a churchy, out there, almost invisible thing to talk about. And this is why the Psalms are so good, because they talk about the glory of God through the uh, poetic prism of hum human emotion and experience. So we're talking about the glory of God and we're like uh, sailing through the stars and the planets. And then the next verse, we're down in the maternity ward and we're changing the diaper of a screaming infant. And then we're right back up to the moon and the planets and the cosmos. And then we're all the way back down to the, to the fish that swim through the rivers on their way to the ocean. I love Psalm 8, and there's something so healthy in this question. In verse 4, we find the question, what is man? But look at how the question is set up in verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, then the question, verse 5, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? There's something very healthy in this question. Let me ask you, this is a very simple question. Pro probably somebody has already asked you this question today. We ask each other this question all the time. The question is this. On a Sunday, I'll ask you or your friend will ask you, how was your week last week? How was your week last week? 
It's easy to answer. Either I had a good week last week or I had a bad week last week. It's a simple question. We don't have to think very long or like write out a dissertation to answer it. It's a simple question. But what it reveals about us is revealed actually in the, the question behind the question, which is, when I asked you how was your week last week, how did you decide what to say? How did you gauge it? How do you decide if it's a good week or a bad week? There's really only one way you answer that question, the same way I answer that question. The way you decide if it was a good week or a bad week is, was it good or bad for me, myself, and I? Were my desires met? Were my feelings hurt? Was my cause advanced? Or was it frustrated? It's very easy to answer that question because we're always thinking about ourselves. Last week was a good week because I got a promotion. Last week was a bad week because I got in a car accident. Last week was a good week because my favorite flavor was the custard of the day. Last week was a bad week because I had to go to the dentist and get work done. Last week was a bad week because I lost my wedding ring. Last week was a good week because I got it back. Either way, either way, the way we answer the question is if, so, if, if whatever, it's like, I mean, look again at Psalm 8, verse 3, the moon, the stars that you've created. Verse 4, what is man? Look, the way you answer this question is generally, look at the moon, the stars, the planets, how they revolve around me. Whoever decides what the flavor of the day is going to be where I get my custard better be aware of my preferences. Every other driver on the road better be aware that my car can't get crashed. We think that the whole thing revolves around us. And there's something so phenomenally healthy in this poem, in this hymn, because that's not the movement. The movement is that in verse 3, this, this, um, this sort of inspired poet says, wow, look at everything in the world. Look at the stars. Look at everything. Man, I'm so small. Why would anyone, why would anyone make a big deal out of me? Much less God. Why would God even look my way? Verse 5 is critical for the answer of our question. In verse 4, we ask the question, what is man? Verse 5 in Psalm 8 says, yet you have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. Man, a little lower than the angels. I, you know, Aquinas, C.S. Lewis. I think actually um, William Shakespeare knew his Bible well. The, the great soliloquy on humanity that Shakespeare wrote into Hamlet, I think, I, I hear Psalm 8 all over it. Hamlet says, What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and movement, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how even like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. And yet, and because it's Hamlet speaking, and if... Shakespeare ever wrote a melancholy, depressive character. It's Hamlet. So he gives this whole thing about how glorious man is, and then there's an and yet, because it's Hamlet, and this is what he says, and yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust that is man? Man delights me not. What is man? Verse 5 answers the question when it says man is that being of creation whom God has crowned with glory and honor. Man is crowned with glory and honor. This is, this is phenomenally striking 
because that word glory in verse five, it belongs to us. It says that every woman and every man has been crowned with glory and honor. But the word glory doesn't first show up in verse five. Look at Psalm eight, find the word glory. It shows up in verse one and it's talking about God, God's glory. And God himself has in a unique way given that glory, not to the oxen and the, the animals in the field, not to the angels in the invisible realms. God has given that glory in a unique way to us. And then it says in verse six, you have given man dominion over the work of your hands. Hebrews chapter two, verse five, said it was not to angels that God gave dominion. It was not to animals that God gave dominion. It was to us that he gave dominion. Dominion is a God word. Glory is a God word and dominion is a God word and they're both given to us. This is how the poet here in Psalm eight emphasizes man's unique nature. Psalm, Hebrews two, is a faithful sermon, and a faithful sermon is an explanation of Scripture. Hebrews 2 is an explanation and application of Psalm 8. Do you know Psalm 8, though it's a poem, is a sermon. And Psalm 8 is a faithful sermon because Psalm 8 is a faithful explanation and application of a previous Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Have you heard these verses before? These verses say, Then God said. To whom does God speak? before there's a man created for God to be speaking to. And yet Genesis 1 verse 26 says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let the man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Psalm 8 is an explanation and application of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Even as going forward, Hebrews 2 is an explanation and application of Psalm 8. So all of this is true of humanity, that we have this dominion and we have this glory, and yet, and yet, we know that that's not the whole story. Because man is destined for glory, but we know in our experience, man is dying and fallen and corrupted. You ever hear these verses? For although humanity knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts in impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1, 21 to 25. Man created unfallen, but man fallen, corrupted, exchanged, turned aside. Man is Adam, unfallen as created. Man is us as fallen and corrupted. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know, because Romans goes on to say, the wages of sin, the wages of sin is death, which is a disaster, not, a, not an ultimate destiny. Back to that simple question that somebody maybe already asked you before the sermon started. How was your week? You said if it was good or bad. Have you ever been able to answer that question, how was your week, by saying, my, my week was, um, uh, I exercised perfect dominion over everything in creation. Nothing frustrated me and everything was perfect. It's not that way yet. Creation frustrates us all the time. Yesterday, I was, I was in my own basement. 
our basement is finished. It's nice down there. That's where our room is and TV and stuff. I was walking through the basement and I walked right into a big spider. He was like spinning his web from the, from the ceiling down and he was like right, he just like hit my eye and I just screamed and ran away. I left the house and I don't even want to go home when I get done with this service. <laughs> Creation is frustrating. It's fallen. You don't need me to, you don't need me to theologize to you about that. A spider's a goofy example, but how many times last week did people who are supposed to protect and love you instead cut and wound you? We do that to each other all the time. Things aren't what they ought to be. Everything's not as it should be. And it wasn't that way for the Hebrews who first heard this sermon in Hebrews 2 from Psalm 8. They see God's design, but it's frustrated. And is there anything more frustrating and sad than potential wasted? Maybe you had somebody in your class who was voted most likely to succeed but everybody who you still know from your class talks about how that, that very person who was most likely to succeed is the one that ended up, whatever, in jail or worse. I went to college at University of Southern California and I had a classmate. He was actually in the same major that I was. So I had like two or three communications classes with him and his name was Todd. His name was Todd Marinovich. I don't know if you recognize that name. It was a big story back on the West Coast. I don't know if it was a big story here, but he was a quarterback for the USC Trojans the, the years that I was there in college. And the thing about Todd Marinovich was they called him Robo QB because his training to be quarterback of the SC Trojans began while he was inside his mother's womb. His father crafted this neonatal diet to develop him to be a quarterback. And they have little home videos of him before he could walk, pushing a little weighted medicine ball and stuff like that. And he had never had refined sugar. He had never had all this stuff. And he was just, so 1991, he, Todd Marinovich was drafted in the NFL like uh, 12 or 13 picks before another player who was drafted in 1991, Brett Favre. And Todd Marinovich never amounted to anything because of personal problems and criminal activity and drugs and all, all the rest of it. The story that Genesis and Psalms and Hebrews and Revelation tells about us is more tragic than that. What is man? Man is Adam, created perfect and unfallen, not by a careful mother and father, but by God Almighty, his masterpiece. And yet man is us, fallen and corrupted, exchanged the glory of God for useless, worthless things, and we bear the corruption within our own body, we bear the corruption in the ground, in the thorns that spring up and frustrate us in everything that we do. And that corruption is so deep and so steep I'm not the only pastor here. What do we got? Five full-time pastors. And that's not enough to care for personally all of the needs in all of the lives of those who are a part of the church. Everything on this planet groans and hurts and dies and kills. Back to Hebrews 2. The destiny of man to have dominion, yet man suffers in the dust and death. And what Hebrews 2 tells us is what Genesis 1 whispered about, what Psalm 8 sang lowly behind the main melody line is finally fulfilled in Hebrews 2 because it says the role intended for humanity has finally been fulfilled by one of us, the Son of Man, the Son of God, namely the man, Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews 2 verse 5, 
it's interesting that Hebrews 2 verse 5 uses this, what we would call eschatological language or end times language. You see how it says in verse 5, uh, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. <laughs> Look, this world where we run into spiders in the basement and where we say mean, hurtful things to each other, this is not the world to come. This is not the world as it should be. There is a world to come where that stuff will be rolled back. And that's the world that we're talking about here. That's the world that Jesus came to bring us. And so what happened is when Jesus Christ lived in our place, died in our place, the, old, the wages of sin is death, when Jesus died on the cross, and then because he's Jesus, the sinless one, the, the second Adam, unfallen, without a sin nature, when he died on the cross paying for our sin, he was able to rise again from the dead because death had no dominion over him. He was perfect. He rolled back the curse. And when Jesus came out of the tomb, the age to come just began to dawn. And it even says here in Hebrews 2, we don't yet see it. We don't yet see it because we still suffer and we still sin and we die and we don't yet see it, but we see Jesus. And as he is, so we shall be. It is very significant that we have talked about the Son of God was mentioned in Hebrews 1, the promised one to come was mentioned in Hebrews 1, but we never put a name on it. We never put a name on it until Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. The human name of Jesus is mentioned the very first time in the epistle because he has come to save us. This one human being, this one human being is isolated and isn't it so interesting that it says, for a little while, he was made lower than the angels. And then, if this isn't good news, I don't know what is. For a little while, he tasted death. We know people that die and they're dead. It's not a taste, it's death. But when Jesus died, it was a little taste. Because he conquered death. Unfallen, the second Adam, the final Adam came to rescue us. That's the whole thing. The whole, the greatest story of redemption is that Jesus Christ has come to show us what we were always destined to be. Psalm 8 actually says that everything in the universe is now under his feet. You see that in verse 8? Putting everything in subjection under his feet. Do you recognize that language of under his feet? Every faithful Bible sermon is an explanation and application of Bible revelation. That phrase, under his feet, you should recognize it as the very first promise of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. A promise given, hear me, women, a promise given to a broken-hearted mom. And the Spirit of God said to her, your seed will crush under his feet the skull of the one who has brought sin and death. All of these promises leading to Jesus. So this is what's promised, and yet it says there we don't yet see it. Verse 8 says, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We don't see this yet. Creation still frustrates us. We see nature red in tooth and claw. We see death coming for us all. We don't yet see God praised and glorified like he should be. Oh, but one day we will. And we will only see that because of Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. How did this happen? How did this salvation come to us? You better know these words. RBC, you better know these words because they matter. This happened because Jesus went through the incarnation. Because Jesus suffered at the crucifixion. Because Jesus was victorious at the resurrection. And because Jesus has experienced the ascension with the promise to return for us. 
Man is destined in Adam, and yet man is dying all around us. And yet the last Adam has come so that man's death can be destroyed and his destiny regained. This is what we find in Jesus. Our mission as a church is to make and train disciples of Jesus. And did you know, did you know that when we find someone and we make them into a disciple of Jesus, did you know that we're helping them to become more human? Not less. We're helping them to become more of the person that God created them to be. In Jesus, it's all fulfilled. The true destiny of humanity. Everything else is a loss. And so Hebrews is, Hebrews, the, 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 the pastor who wrote Hebrews, just like your pastor, is pleading with you, whatever happens, don't let go of Jesus. If you let go of Jesus, you lose everything. You lose eternal life. You lose, the, you lose salvation. But more than that, ultimately, you'll even lose your own humanity. You'll never be what you could have been. Hebrews 2 brings it all back to Jesus. Man is Adam. Man is us. Man is Jesus. The big story of the Bible is that Satan, one of the angels, Lucifer, he preened and he postured and he faked his way into some kind of exaltation. And Jesus, the son of man, humbled himself and went low, down way lower than he should have been. So that this created angel who preened and postured above where he should have been is now conquered by the one God man who humbled himself lower than he ever could have gone, even to the point of death on the cross. Satan exalted himself and tricked man out of the universe. So the Son of God humbled himself to recapture for a lost humanity the very title of the universe and all the glories thereunto. In Adam, we lost it. In Jesus, we have won it. Adam abased us. Jesus exalts us. The grand story of humanity from Genesis all the way through Psalm 8, through Hebrews 2, all the way to Revelation. John Henry Newman, praise to the holiest in the height and in the depths be praised. In all his works most wonderful, most sure in all his ways. O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. O oh, wisest love, that flesh and blood which did in Adam fail should strive afresh against the foe, should strive and should prevail. Adam lost it. Jesus, in that same flesh and blood, won it. In Adam we have failed, but in Jesus we have prevailed. So hold on to him. Let's pray. We bow together. Let me lead you in a simple prayer. Lord God, as I've opened your word, Spirit of God, as you have helped me to see myself and as you've helped me to see my Savior, God, lead me onward now, not to forget what you've taught me, not to ignore what you've warned me about, but to cling to it and to boldly, lovingly share it through my life with all of those around me. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church, this is God's word to you, Racine Bible Church. Every evil that you have so long endured will be crushed by Christ our King. And to him will be all glory 
forever and ever. Amen.